So uh, this is this introductory lab is similar to what we did actually at the beginning of 201, um, going over some. Uh, well, we're not going to do the whale part, but we're going over the um, scientific method and talking about hypotheses and so on and so forth. Um, there are two documents for this lab. The first were the instructions, which you should have read and will refer back to when completing the assignment. So after this little lecture, um, the rest of the time will be for you to work on the assignment. Um, on the assignment, you're going to be using Excel, so inputting um, data into Excel and using it to graph um, and make charts. Um, this is a skill that we will be doing a lot in this class, in our labs. Um, and so we've give, I've given you just kind of an exercise with some dummy data for you to go through and do that. Okay. All right, so before we get into that, though, we'll talk about first um, some information and questions and then um, hypotheses and kind of go through the scientific method that way. All right, so I have two fertilizers here. Fertilizer A, which has a high nitrogen content, and fertilizer B, which has a high phosphorus content. Okay, so um, first, what are fertilizers used for? Set aid in the plant. Right, so um, in this, uh, the information I've given you, uh, it's inferred that we're going to try and grow some plants, okay? So what are some questions you might have based on this little information I have given you. Discuss among your group mates. So there are lots of variables you could discuss within there, but first you might want to know, all right, well, uh, will fertilizers, these fertilizer A and fertilizer B, contribute to plant growth? Okay, that's kind of a basic um, question there. And then I think beyond that, will one higher in nitrogen or higher in phosphorus um, help plant grow, okay? So these are um, questions we could then form into hypotheses. Okay, we have a few different kinds of hypotheses. First is our biological hypothesis and what, how are these structured or how have we st uh, structured these in 201? If-then hypothesis, right? Yeah. Okay, so if some sort of biological mechanism uh, then some sort of predictive statement, okay? All right, so in your groups, make a if-then hypothesis based on um, the information and questions we had before. So um, these can become kind of tough, right? So if you remember, we're going we're gonna to start with our if and our biological mechanism. Um, so what's our biological mechanism? What are we trying to study here? Plant growth, okay. Um, and what is, going to, what is contributing to plant growth? Okay, the fertilizer. And what specifically in the fertilizer? Okay, so um, uh, a good biological mechanism there is if nitrogen and phosphorus are, again, we're talking about plant growth. And so if you're adding, if, if when you add these, they increase growth, then they must be limiting. So if nitrogen and phosphorus are limiting nutrients to plant growth, then what's our prediction? Okay, okay, what would be a um, longer way of saying how they work? What are they working? What are they doing? Okay, yeah, so then adding fertilizers to soil will increase plant growth. Okay, this isn't the only hypothesis you could have uh, made with that information. Okay, what if you, your hypothesis was more concerned with, sorry? If, do you mean if 
vitamin P are limited in trees? Uh, limiting, as in they are limiting the growth of normal plants. Then why would adding more increase the plant growth? So if the amount of nitrogen in the, in the soil or the amount of phosphorus in the, just a the normal soil is limiting plant growth, then if we add nitrogen to that soil, they should grow more. That making sense? Okay. <laughs> I'll explain it again later. All right. <clears throat> All right. So what other comparisons might you want it to make? So I'm just saying fertilizers in general, nitrogen or phosphorus, would increase plant growth. What else? I, I, what other hypotheses did you guys have? There, um, if certain plants react better with nitrogen fertilizer, then they will not grow as much okay. with phosphorus. Good, right. So if you wanted to compare differences between nitrogen and phosphorus, then you would structure this differently, right? <laughs> so if you would say if, if nitrogen is more limiting than phosphorus um, to plant growth, then adding a fertilizer high in nitrogen cont content would increase plant growth more than phosphorus fertilizers. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, so anyway, this is just one possible hypothesis. You could have different ones, and you could even, you know, switch them and say phosphorus is greater than the other. Okay, so what is H sub O? Right, so this is our null hypothesis, and this is, allows us to test things statistically. Um, the null hypothesis generally says what? Right, so there's nothing happening, there's no difference, there's no correlation, something like that. All right, so our null hypothesis is there is no growth in plants when fertilizers are added. Okay. No growth at all, or no extra. Growth? No, uh, yeah, no extra growth. I would say, how about no increase? Be a good one. Increase in plant growth. Okay, but if you were comparing nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers, what would the null hypothesis be? No difference. Right, so you'd say there's no difference in plant growth in whether you add um, phosphorus fertilizers or nitrogen fertilizers, okay? All right, the alternative hypothesis then is what? Generally says there is a difference, right? So it's really just the opposite of the null. There is or there will be an increase okay and this was also a one-sided um, hypothesis Okay, where I said uh, there's specifically going to be an increase, okay? Um, but you could also make a more general null hypothesis and say there is no change in growth when you add a fertilizer, okay? And then the alternative hypothesis would be there is a change in growth when you add a, a fertilizer, okay? Um, none of them is right or wrong, it all just depends on what your initial question is and what you're going to test. Okay? All right, any questions on that? Okay. All right, with um, then setting up an experiment, we first have to understand our variables, okay? So what is an independent variable? 
Um, well, it is needed. It's what we use actually to set things up. Yeah. It's not affected by the experiment. Well, it is the experiment. It's what we use to affect the other thing. Right, yeah. So it's kind of the cause. It is what we have control over, right? So... All right, so this is the variable in question. Does fertilizer A or fertilizer B <clears throat> have an effect on plant growth, right? So this is what we can control. In effect, this is our cause, right? All right, what's the dependent variable then? Right, so this is the result, okay? The measured variable, or let's say factor, after the treatment. Okay, so the independent variable then you could also say is the treatment. What are we manipulating? What are we changing? And then the dependent variable is going to be the effect, okay, which is ultimately going to be our results. Okay, so these go together. The independent variable is also um, graphed on the x-axis, and the dependent is on the y-axis if you're going to make a, a, a graph, a bar graph, or a scatter plot or something. All right, independent variables can be continuous or categorical. What is a continuous variable? Okay, uh, percentages, amounts, right? These are um, variables. That are on a scale, it can be scaled. So they are um, so um, Oh, we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so some examples of a continuous variable, percentage, what else? Temperature, Temperature good. Time. Time. Okay, height, length, mass. Anything that has a uh, discrete and quantitative. Values. So they can also be um, split into smaller and smaller and smaller, um, you know, subsections. So you can have an inch, you can have a tenth of an inch, a hundredth of an inch, a millionth of an inch, right? They are all within a scale and can get smaller and smaller infinitively. All right, what about a c categorical variable? Something like color. Mm -hmm. All right, so these are variables that are set in groups. Okay, or are qualitative. So color, what are some other examples? Okay, types of plants, what do you say? Gender. Gender or sex, okay. Um, yes, those are all good. All right, so <clears throat> when setting up our experiment, we can identify then whether variables are continuous or categorical. And whether they are will depend on what type of graph we use to display them. So we're going to set up our experiment where we have three plots in a greenhouse where everything is kept constant. Um, same water, same amount of sunlight, same temperature. Um, in each plot, we'll put a different amount of a substance 
Um, 10 grams will be given to fertilizer A, um, sorry, in plot A, 10 grams of fertilizer B to plot B, and then 10 grams of water in plot C. Okay, what, what is plot C? Why are we adding water to a third plot? Yeah. It's the control. Good, yeah, so this is our control group. And why do we have a control group? Right, exactly. So the effect of the variable, you have to have a baseline, right? So that's what our control is. Um, without the control, we don't know if there's a significant effect. And even if we are um, only interested in comparing A and B, we still want to know if A and B are doing anything, right? So if there's a big difference between A and B, or let's say there's no difference between A and B, but then when you compare them to C, there's also no difference to C. Well, we can say that the fertilizer itself doesn't really work. Okay? So controls are important for understanding if there's an effect um, compared to a baseline. Now there are two types of controls, uh, negative and positive. Is this one a negative control or a positive control? It's not positive. Negative. It's negative, right? So negative control is where you, um, where you expect the result will have no effect, right? We're just adding water, so we don't expect anything to happen. That's our, our baseline. A positive control is going to be if you have a, a known effect, right? So let's say we have a fertilizer that has both nitrogen and phosphorus in it. That could be our positive control. Okay? All right, so... Now that we have our experiment set up, we run it for a week, we get some results. Here's our data that we gathered, <clears throat> okay, from our three plots. And all right, so can you tell just by looking at this data which one worked the best or if there was an effect? I mean, not really, you what can kind of. Uh, grams. Yeah, so we measured biomass. You could have done height or um, you could have measured leaf or fruit or you know something else. Is this some, how much it like grew each time or is it? Is so it after a week we harvested all of them and we measured them on a scale. Oh. Yeah. So Alright so what, what do you need then so we have some data here but what do we need to now do to the data to make comparisons? Find the average. Okay good yeah so we're gonna Yes, so scatter plot is used with continuous variables when both of them are continuous, okay? So let's say rather than, you know, the, using the same for each plot, in one of the plots, I took fertilizer A and I added different amounts. Yeah, so I wouldn't put the G there, actually. So. Sheesh. So different amounts of fertilizer A in grams, and then I still measured biomass after a week. Okay, so at each point or each different amount, I would then have a corresponding... X and Y variable. Okay, so in this instance, we saw at low amounts not very much growth, but in these mid amounts, we saw an increase. And then at some point, it looks like there was too much fertilizer and that decreased the growth as well. Okay, so scatter plots when both are continuous.
All right, a bar graph is used when? Okay, good. So if your independent variable is categorical, which is how we set up our experiment. We have plot A, plot B, and plot C, and then average biomass, and let's say plot A had around 30, Seven plot B had around 30 and plot C had 10 right so now we're plotting the averages of each of those groups and then for error bars we would use the standard deviation Okay, and so then that allows us to visually see differences in our data. <clears throat> All right, the last one then, a histogram, is going to be used to as kind of a subset of the data. So histograms, we're looking at the frequency of a categorical variable. So let's say we, we looked at the plants in plot A and we split them into small, medium, and large. Okay, and for small we said was 0 to 5 grams, medium was 5 to 10 grams, and large was 10 or more grams. And on the y-axis, then, we have how many times or how many plants fit into each of those groups. So let's say in the small category, we had four. In the medium category, there were seven that were between five and ten, and the large, there were two. Okay, so another thing you can do with a continuous variable is you can make it categorical by dividing it into ranges of some sort. And you'll see this with, uh, if anyone ever... Um, if any of your professors break down your grades into a histogram, they'll grade it, put it into smaller categories. So everyone who got 95 or above would be in one, or 90 to 95 in another, and you would see how many people got each grade. Right. Okay, so what we're going to do today with your assignment then, you've got some if-then hypotheses and other hypotheses to look at. And then you're going to look at the data, what type of variables are in each. And then you're going to import that data into Excel and make some graphs. Okay?